good evening friends thank you sundar uh, it's really pleasure to have kanak dikshit with us kanak dikshit is a person who actually symbolizes what it means to be a south asian to be a south asian is not to be trapped with the foreign policy establishment of your respective countries and not to be trapped by the security establishment of your respective countries to be liberated from these two powerful institutions needs enormous courage and more than that compassion and kanak represents that compassion the biggest advantage of having that compassion is that he becomes a facilitator for dialogue during really difficult times whenever the india pakistan relationship goes down we always looked at kana to become a moderator for india nepal dialogues because yeah. nobody thinks the yeah. india pakistan uh, uh, dialogue uh, he becomes our moderator we had about 10 rounds of meeting between the indian and the pakistani editors and for all the uh, 10 rounds we had kana as a moderator because it gave a certain amount of comfort to both these countries that it's been moderated by a person who is not representing a vested interest and that space is very very important because we need somebody who can open up the space which is getting closed by a institutional arrangement kana as a journalist is a very very meticulous reporter Hanex reportage on Bhutan was the first one which actually documented the large scale internal migration within the region which is the Nepali speaking Bhutanese migration that is a one migration about which there is a deafening silence and that migration was extensively documented by Kanak in his journalism the another thing in connects journalism is that he manages to become a local he has no problem in finding fault with the neighboring countries he does not get into diplomatic niceties the way you he can say india is wrong he can say nepal is wrong and he can say bangladesh is wrong he can say islamabad is wrong and he can say bhutan is wrong without having this fear of being politically correct and this space what he generated helped us to even look at our own systems much more critically anak as a activist has done two interesting work one is the role of kanak in reviving public transport in the kathmandu valley and the second is kanak final injury institute these two things are so important because it is done purely without having a institutional backing when he started now everybody is talking about it but we have seen it during its initial stages it was purely a labor of love and that labor of love made these two things into institutions Anna has a special relationship with Roja Mutia Library. You would have seen the images screen here earlier. It's called Madan Prashka. That is a documentation center, archival center in Nepal. That archival center in Nepal and Roja Mutia Library have been working with each other for years. And uh, people in Madan Prashka always consider that. it was roja mutaya which gave them necessary tools to their uh, to do their own documentation and they always feel that they are sister organization to rmr and thank you kanak for coming and go to kanak as speak from here uh Well, Paneer, you made me red in the face. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, some of it was undeserved, 
but the facts were right. Thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Chennai because across the expanse of the subcontinent from Kathmandu to Chennai, uh, you find brother or sister spirits here, the way you don't find in large parts of the northern half of the subcontinent. So, um, there must be something umbilical across this great expanse. And so, thank you for having me here. I do want to uh, say a little, a few words about RMRL, the institution we are in right now and the organization that I am also linked to by virtue of my father having been an archivist who passed away a year and a half ago, but whose legacy uh, continues in Kathmandu through the organization that I am now affiliated with. Uh, any society cannot really seek a place in what we in a positive sense call civilization if it does not value archives. And uh, that is where we learned from um, Sundar and from RMRL that uh, within South Asia, outside of the portals of government was an archive that tried to stay closest to the high professionalism uh, of the archivist. This is something that uh, I have realized there is a, I am not an archivist myself, I just help manage an archive, but uh, the archivist is a person at a higher level of human being. In that sense, uh, they are selfless, they understand the value of the word, even though nobody may be reading whatever you have collected for another two decades, but you still collect it because you know that Humanity's advance requires it. And that is what we have learned from RMRL and that is what we have learned therefore from Chennai. That's why it's also an additional pleasure to be here. Now, um, I talked about the links between the two institutions, MPP in Kathmandu and RMRL here. Um, now I will get into uh, the links between Nepal and the rest of South Asia by way of introducing the topic for today, which is Nepal turns the corner. <clears throat> we all know that uh, about in the medieval area, era, till the late medieval era, uh, till essentially the colonists arrived in South Asia, South Asia was one of the richer parts of the world of the day. In that sense, Kathmandu was also wealthy. And it had a lot of what you may call soft power. Something that my present day uh, co-citizens in Nepal tend to forget. Because we have been told often enough that we are a country, a small country between large neighbors. That we are poor and underdeveloped and on and on. But if you go back three centuries and more. Even up to about the early 1700s, uh, Nepal meant mostly Kathmandu Valley. And Kathmandu Valley was a prosperous cauldron because it was a former lake bed and hence the soil was rich. It gave you paddy agriculture. Some say it was the best paddy in Asia, paddy agriculture. And then by virtue of its placement, it could do a lot of trade and entrepreneur trade between the south and the north, it is said. I personally have not really found enough evidence of trade between India, the Gangetic Plains and Tibet via Kathmandu, but there was a lot of trade and even extra territoriality with Tibet, which gave again Kathmandu Valley a lot of wealth. And the fact that this concentrated area uh, had three kingdoms, three kingdoms that competed with, with each other for artistic advance. Which meant that the woodwork, the bronze work, the silver, the filigree, the repousse work, all of it was in competition reaching for really high cultural achievement. So that is where Kathmandu was. And in terms of links to the rest of South Asia, back then, the chief abbot of Pashupatinath, till today, are Namudari Brahmin. The name for the soldier in 
the local language of Kathmandu Valley is Tilanga, which meant that just as in later years as Nepal fell into penury, Nepalese went elsewhere to become Gorkhas. Gorkhas for the British and Gorkhas for the Indian Army. Back then it was the Tilangana population that arrived. Then you have the Karnatak Bangshis who came in through the Lichavi route to rule over Nepal and brought the Taleju Bhavani um, Devi as the god of the kings of Kathmandu Valley. My town or my city state if you will called Patan uh, has the most uh, energetic and uh, inclusive uh, festival I have seen anywhere in South Asia and I it's a chariot festival and I think the Puri chariot festival is stayed in comparison but the god within it arrives from Kamrup uh, about perhaps seven centuries ago uh, it is Machindranath uh, also known in the local parlance as Bungdeo also known as the uh, the avatar of Lokeshwar in the Buddhistic Vajrayan tradition. So, what this tells us is Kathmandu was very well connected by culture to the rest of South Asia. Not just the contiguous plains of the uh, Ganga Maidan, but actually further off, northern Kerala, Karnataka, Telangana, Kamrup, and elsewhere. So, this is where Nepal was. Now I will take you through an accelerated pace uh, of history till the point where I claim before you that Nepal is turning the corner. Historically, the three kingdoms of Kathmandu Valley were invaded by King Prithvi Narayan Shah of Gorkha, hence the term Gorkha and Gorkhali and the Gorkha language which became the Thas Bhasa, which became the Nepali language in its calling. Prithvi Narayan Shah was king of a small principality, but through his guile, his Machiavellian spirit, as well as matrimonial alliances and fighting capacity, he actually, uh, you could call him an empire builder. If we think of empires as vast expanses, he of course became the king of a unified Nepal in the mid-1700s. Uh, but if you think of the terrain of Nepal, as the uh, economist Mahesh Chandra Regmi writes, it required an empire building capacity to unite Nepal back then. This is what he did. Coming now down right through history, he moved the capital to Kathmandu Valley because he knew that Kathmandu was the jewel in the crown. So Kathmandu had to be overtaken. Then. The local Newar culture weakened somewhat over the next two centuries. After uh, about two generations, there was a shogunate that began in Nepal. The Ranas who took over and ruled in the name of the king, that means Prithvi Narayan Shah's descendants. And they essentially squeezed the economy, the people. Firstly for some expansionary wars and then for self-aggrandizement and building massive palaces and slowly converting themselves into from these uh, hill fighters to uh, very uh, uh, sophisticated, Europe, almost like European sophisticates. If you go to the Madan Puraskar library, the counterpart of RMRL in Kathmandu and the Ranas had a photographic compilation of their evolution and you see in the beginning these are dark skinned hill people uh, who are trying to wear European attire and by the end of it which is the 1950s these are as I say European sophisticates but what they did in between was squeeze the economy dry and the process of Nepalese going out of Nepal to work began because of the penury that was foisted upon the Nepali people. Very well documented by a, a Jesuit padre, a Ludwig Stiller, 
uh, in the book that he called The Silent Cry about the people of Nepal being squeezed over two centuries by the Kathmandu based and the Kathmandu centric state. So that is what was happening to the people. But in the meantime, the Nepali state was maintaining its independence. Maintaining its independence for a day when Nepal had both democracy and stability. Which is the point that we are achieving about now, is what I will come back to. But on the other hand, if you have your, the ability to take your own decisions and make your own mistakes, you are liable to move ahead in terms of providing social justice, economic growth and social justice to your people. But the Nepali people, descendants after descendants, generations after generations, have always waited for this moment. In the meantime, the sovereignty was kept intact. Again, through a lot of guile, uh, through a lot of, uh, the Nepali word is chakari, which means sucking up to the British. And uh, keeping also the British happy, saying, we will take care of this messy hill principalities. You let us rule the country. You do your bit in the plains. That was the kind of gentleman's understanding between the Shah rulers who came later, but then mostly the Ranas and the British viceroys. So, that is how it moved. The Rana family became richer and richer. The people became poorer and poorer. Uh, but the sovereignty was maintained for a future date, as I like to say, when you could utilize that sovereignty for the sake of agency, for the, on behalf of the people. Came a gentleman named uh, one of the Ranas who consolidated the Rana hold on the economy and the polity. His name was Jang Bahadur. The way Jang Bahadur did this was, he, firstly he went to Europe. He became the first South Asian, as they called it in the British library, the potentate. If you go to the South Asia reading room in the British library, formerly the India office collection, the centerpiece of the uh, paintings of uh, South Asian potentates is the is Jang Bahadur. He went to England to see before any other South Asian prince or princeling or king had been to this was in um, the mid 1800s. He went there specifically to find out how much weaponry and how much firepower did the British have and what should be his plan vis-a-vis -vis the British as they were expanding into the Gangetic Plains moving on westward. He realized that you could not find the, fight the British. So he came back and one of the first things he did during the Sepoy mutiny was to come directly to the support of the British. Which made the colonizers beholden to Jang Bahadur and the Ranas and Nepal for a long time to come. He took his contingent, he personally led it into Lucknow and even what many people don't know into Banaras. And he came back and it is also said a lot of the loot that ended, in the, in the, ended up in the crown of the Nepali kingship was loot from Abad. At the same time though what he did was he managed to provide refuge to Begum Hazrat Mahal and Nana Sahib when they were fleeing. So here on the one hand he was helping the British but on the other hand he was saying my sovereign status allows me and uh, requires me to give refuge. To those that come seeking refuge. And that's why Hazrat Mahal is presently buried in her ma mazar next to the clock tower in Kathmandu. Then comes, we jump about three generations, we come to Chandra Samshir. In 19, uh, he ruled longest for a Rana Shogun and essentially he was the ruler in the name, ruling in the name of the king from 1902 to about 1923 if I remember correctly. In 1913, he was able to reach out to the governor general, uh, by that time it was a governor general, was it still a viceroy, I forget. But uh, December 1913, a treaty was signed that very few people in Nepal even remember today. But that treaty made Nepal independent for the modern era, for the sake of the modern era. Because it made Nepal getting more salutes than the, I think it was 18 or 22. I am not a historian, so I can only allude to it. You will have to, if you are more interested, you can go deeper into it. But he got more salutes than all the other Indian princely states. And the signature on that meant, implied that Nepal also became independent during the British times. So when 1947 came along, 
and when it is said Ballabhai Patel, for example, was for subsuming Nepal within within uh, the Indian Union, uh, this treaty would have come up against such a plan. But more importantly, and the next person to keep in mind when we talk about this, and the last person to keep in mind when we talk of this run of personalities from Prithvi Narayansa, Jang Bahadur, Tanra Samshir, you come to BP Koirala and his generation. His generation, they realize that until the British leave India, there is no hope of ridding Nepal of the Rana yoke. So they fought alongside the, Brit, uh, the independence fighters, became independence fighters for India, went to jail with Rajendra Prasad, etc. So what happened is that, this is something that I have not read elsewhere, this is my belief that the bonding that happened between Jawaharlal Nehru and his peer group and the Nepali, what you may call them the freedom fighters, freedom fighters for both India and for Nepal, that bonding would have given Nepal a cover as Nepal moved into the modern era which was the fall of the Ranas. So Nepal's modern era begins in 1950. And that is when uh, many reasons that Nepal remained independent, but I personally feel the primary reason may have been, or a, a good contributory re uh, factor may have been, the socialization between India's first category of rulers and uh, BP Koirala's peers from Nepal. That would have provided the cover so that whoever else might have wanted to bring in Nepal like Hyderabad was brought in. Hyderabad as a much more powerful and richer uh, princely state, Nepal remained. Now, now to come to the present, what happened since then and why do I think Nepal has turned the corner? Uh, firstly, to go back to Father Ludwig Steller, who was also my teacher, who came from the US, lived in Nepal, became a Nepali citizen and wrote A, the book called The Rise of the House of Gorkha and secondly wrote the book called The Silent Cry. This silent cry of the people of Nepal continues to this day. Why? Because firstly you had expansionary wars where there was excessive taxation of the people. Then there was a family, an autocracy, an oligarchy that sucked the country dry. Then after that you have the modern era which begins in 1950. So to quickly run through the modern era, 1950 to 1959, political parties that had suddenly come sprouted and the Ranas fell and uh, the royal palace was playing game. New Delhi was playing game and there was always an instability. Finally, the elections in 1959. So Nepal for the first time got democratic governance, which in my view is absolutely essential in the context of Nepal. People do say, oh Bhutan, look at Bhutan or look at Singapore in Nepal all the time. And Nepali leaders are always promising we'll make Nepal a Singapore and a Switzerland. But now they have finally stopped saying it for various reasons. But for the, in the case of Nepal, it seems clear that for the kind of uh, complex society that Nepal is, with the diversity the, in ethnicity, the diversity in flora, fauna, in geography, the diversity in altitude. This is something no other country has to say. Nepal has got altitudinal diversity that also impacts so much of its quality. In all of this, Nepal can only survive in stability and democracy, not one without the other. So those who say we need a Lee Kuan Yew, and there are enough people in Nepal who say we need a Lee Kuan Yew, that Lee Kuan Yew is not able to sort out Nepal's problem. We need a messy democracy, nothing else, nothing more and nothing less. In that context, what happened was Nepal arrived at the point of democracy in 1959, but it was with BP Koirala as Prime Minister. That was a time when Nepal was suddenly part of the world stage and the Nepalese Whoever understood international politics was un seeing that here we have a leader at par, shoulder to shoulder with Sukarno, with uh, Chawan Lai, with Jawaharlal Nehru, also a member of the Socialist International. And this man will now move us ahead uh, into, not only into the committee of nations, but towards full-fledged uh, democratic values infiltrating the country. And if you look at his first ministry, his first cabinet, the most inclusive cabinet, we have not had such an inclusive cabinet till today. And in his wall was a picture of a Nepali peasantry to remind him every day that that is why I am Prime Minister. 
to serve that peasant. It didn't work out that way because King Mahendra conducted a coup with the help of the army and uh, put uh, B.P. Koirala in jail. Later he went into exile. Again, to come back to what I think, uh, why I think we may have turned the corner, we have to pick up the agenda that was missed in 1959 to pick it up today. Uh, that is the theme of my presentation, of course. And uh, I'll now move on with the progression. So after 1959, all of 18 months, the Panchayat regime began. It is a royal autocracy. And there are some things that the royal autocracy did. Okay, it kept the sovereignty intact. But that doesn't mean that the democracy, Democrat would not have kept the sovereignty intact. Uh, there are certain things in for which King Mahendra is given credit for. But he could never be what a democratic leader could have been. Either in the world's recognition of Nepal, which Nepalis do pine for after all, uh, but more than that, the inability to create a for democracy called the panchayat system, somewhat different from the panchayati raj that is known in, the, in India. This is the panchayat system, which was essentially a structure, a guided democracy from bottom to top, but not democratic. So hence, for 30 years, Nepalese could not act on their genius as uh, citizens of Nepal. So as a result, Nepal never rose. There was, for example, in business, there was a glass ceiling beyond which you could never rise. Uh, corruption was concentrated in the royal palace. There was uh, enough of that as well, relative to the income of the country of the day. But most importantly, people did not have, we had stability, 30 years of more or less stability. Uh, in terms of the state as a whole, but no democracy. And without democracy, Nepal cannot move ahead and the country did not prosper. Uh, academia never moved. Schooling never progressed. You, we had numbers. We had uh, school in, increase in numbers, but not the, the quality of the schooling, nor the sensibility, the ethic, the morality, the democratic values, which meant that 1990, every 10 years, Nepal would come to the boil. 1990 was the real departure. As I wrote in an article only last week, as we move towards implementation of the Constitution of Nepal 2015, which is helping us turn the corner, we must remember that the Nepal's entry into the real modern era in terms of values was the Constitution of 1990. Krishna Prasad Bhattrai, a, a fighter at uh, shoulder to shoulder with BP Koirala, a Congress party leader, was the Prime Minister. And the constitution of 1990 gave us universal suffrage. It gave uh, uh, Nepal uh, freedom, the fundamental freedoms. Uh, as a result, press freedom, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, the whole gamut, which Nepalis have taken for granted now. And this is the beauty of the 1990 constitution, that we have taken it for granted. That we don't even talk about the 1990 constitution, in my view, is proof of the success of that constitution. That those are given as self-evident proof. That we don't even have to talk about it. It's part of our being. But then what happened? 1990 was when Nepal became uh, a democratic country, a constitutional monarchy. But within five years, the Maoists, who were at that time a fringe party, who had tried to fight through the electoral process and realized that they were not getting any votes, they decided to use the romantic, romantic leanings of a uh, ill-educated youth populace all over the country, the geography of the country, which is made up of Vietnam's forests and Afghanistan's ravines. As a result, ideal guerrilla territory when there is no roads from which uh, the state can counter. So Nepal then went into a 10-year conflict where the Nepali people, the long-suffering Nepali people saw violence, physical violence enter their lives like never before in their history. Now this seems to be a tall claim to some and some people will tell me but there was always structural violence, gender violence, inter-ethnic uh, and Kathmandu centricism, caste violence from the higher caste, all of that is true and those are to be tackled. And the 1990 constitution opened the doors to tackle such things which would happen with 
improve the practice of democracy and an active civil society. But that was not allowed. It was suddenly a short circuit was uh, implemented in 1990, February 1996 when the Maoists went underground. And essentially what we are coming out of now is something that was triggered back then. Ten years of war and when I told you that the, the kind of violence that visited the villages because the Maoists were hit and run. Right? They never actually controlled any territory. Their propaganda, which a lot of the Western scholars picked up, was that the Maoists controlled 80% of the territory. No, the state was in control everywhere, and the Maoists, what they did was utilize the terrain, hit and run, in and out. In that sense, the, then the state came down with harsh measure, measures. You could call it a scorched earth policy. And so the people were caught in a pincer between the Maoists who came in at night and the soldiers who came during the day. And the uh, excesses began, what you would call the, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity, the abductions, the murders, the extrajudicial killings, the torture. It became commonplace in Nepal as the conflict progressed and the state reaction also began. <coughs> in the meantime, the local government was killed off <coughs> in, a, in a strange kind of a conspiracy between the Maoists and the government. That, at that time it was Sherbad or Deoba. So there was nobody to protect the people. And so much violence committed on them. Why do I say it was more than ever before? <coughs> because earlier they were, Nepal was indeed very violent, but the violence, the physical violence was concentrated in the court. What is to give you one example, what is known as the Koth Massacre. It was a massive bloodletting which brought Jangabhadu to power. Likewise, everywhere there were shenanigans and killing at the court, including from the Malla, Malla and the Lichavi era. But the people were left largely alone. They were poor in poverty, they were in structural uh, uh, violence, suffering structural violence, but they were not in physical violence. So this ended in uh, 2000, exactly 10 years in 2006. Thereafter, the idea was, and uh, I did say back then as well, when the conflict ended, and uh, we also had to challenge King Ganendra, and we were actually uh, incarcerated, even as the people's movement, 19 days of people's movement uh, raged outside. Uh, at that time also I wrote, Nepal turns the corner. And I have written Nepal's turn the corner a few times by now. So you will have to take it with a pinch of salt if you prefer. After I make, I finish my presentation to see whether it's one more, uh, false alarm. Uh, but I have my, the evidence which I will now marshal before you as to believe that Nepal has turned the corner for now. So what has happened is after the Maoists came above ground, uh, we had an interim constitution. The Maoists came above ground when Giriza Prasad Koirala and Giriza Prasad Koirala gave the Maoists as much seat as his opponents in open politics, the UML party, that's the mainstream left, Communist Party of Nepal, United Marxist Leninists, as many seats for the Maoists come above ground as the UML had. And I think that cleared the pitch for the uh, years to come because suddenly the Maoists came above ground and they had the full ability of propaganda and also the complete ability to put instill fear into people. So for a while they even tried to put together a constitution that resembled the constitution of North Korea. But that didn't work out but nevertheless they were fast footwork of people who have also been uh, fighters but more than fighters they have been opportunists in my personal view. So they were able to distort the politics as they came above ground. And democratic values uh, was put on the side and what is known as consensus politics. <coughs> because at that time, <coughs> suddenly the Gora Sahibs, the Western development agencies who had so much money and hence so much clout in Nepal, they decided that Nepal is a country where they could experiment with peace building. So starting with an entity called United Nations Mission to Nepal, um, and then various other agencies, they just picked up any educated Nepali uh, who could write a fairly good sentence in English and made them into consultants. And Nepal lost a whole slab 
of intelligentsia at that time who would speak truth to power or speak truth to populist power so during this period what happened therefore was on the one hand we had to land the maoists into open society on the other hand we also had to tackle the inter community divide that suddenly came to the fore so as far as the maoists are concerned you just need to remember one point that the maoists did not raise the gun against the king's rule this is what the world seems to understand the maoists picked up the gun against a democratic state which happened to be a constitutional monarchy the royal palace was indeed playing games with the democratic state but the maoists did not pick up the gun if anything they had a kind of a collaboration behind the scenes with certain members close to the royal palace just as they may not have taken help from the indian state but they had links within certain elements of the indian state as they got active in nepal so when the maoists came above ground they the we had to have uh, they needed a stop so what is the stop that they took they said we have fought in the name of class warfare and here now we've come above ground what do we tell our cadre what do we tell our fighters <coughs> they had uh, about 8000 fighters but they bamboozled the un to confirm 38000 or 33000 and uh, the state then had to take on that burden so the the maoists coming above ground meant that they needed also one other point we need a pound of flesh if you want to go back to democratic uh, state and we have come up a ground we've got a quite a lot of clout we got the power of propaganda that you guys don't have so the compromise that was reached was one republic the people's movement of nepal did not demand a republic the people's movement of nepal as i recall it because i was part of it and it's very politically incorrect to say this they demanded a democratic state because at that time ganendra had tried to had conducted a coup against the democratic state at that point taking advantage of the maoists in the jungle so one is to make nepal a republic so they could tell their cadre we've got yourself a republic that's, that's good and the second is a, a constituent assembly which is something that the nepali congress had demanded uh, back in the 1950s and had not been granted and uh, my personal feeling is that the 1990 constitution would have been adequate but it was a fait accompli what was achieved because an interim interim uh, parliament declared nepal a republic people like me have decided to accept it wholeheartedly even though we did not fight for republic we fought for fought for democracy uh, without going into the uh, reconstruction of the state but now that it has happened we accept it. there are some individuals that and forces that don't accept it. and there are some fears that nepal might go back to being a hindu kingdom which it cannot never be uh, because 20% of the population by self definition are not hindu so how can you be a hindu state that is the other point which becomes a geopolitical factor in narendra modi's india that's a separate point if there are questions later So now let's go back to the timeline to bring you to the present and why I believe we are turning the corner. So, ten years of conflict, and thereafter two constituent assemblies, one failure, another constituent assembly, and that period is marked not only by Nepal's declaration uh, on paper as a republic and as a secular state uh, and as a federal state without the federal provinces have been defined, but it was declared as a federal state. all of these points just so that you don't get me wrong because i did say we did not fight the people's movement for these quote and quote achievements but i accepted in toto because we have to move ahead and we cannot be going back to a situation which we have accepted as a fait accompli the polity has accepted the people have gone into two elections since then which means it has all been accepted <coughs> the first constitution constituent assembly was utilized in landing the maoists the second constituent assembly was utilized in trying to tackle the inter ethnic 
and inter-community divide. Particularly the one that dealt with ethnicity versus the high caste of Brahmins in particular that rule Kathmandu. Secondly, the Madhesis of the plains who have been challenging the authority and the statist uh, attitude of Kathmandu Valley. Again ruled mostly by people of Brahmin origin, hill Brahmin. Right? So in all of this, the question was paramount in the minds of people was will uh, provincial, the provinces have to be delineated now. So how do you delineate the provinces? How do you make sure that there is an inclusive state? The challenge and the problem of the last 15 years has been that the state could not be inclusive because the politics took on a very strange turn. Everything would have to be done now by consensus. Nothing through, not through political competition but by consensus. Which meant that at the top there was a revolving door among the leaders of the Maoists, Congress and UML. And at the second level the Madhes Badi parties. So suddenly it was a revolving door and everybody knew each other very well. And so, if not you, then me. If not me, then you. This, in my view, took away the soul of democracy for the last 10, 10, 10, 8 years or so. What has happened now is, the constitution was finally written. It was, uh, it was uh, promulgated in September 2015. I should make one other point though. In the last 8 years, the other thing that derailed much of Nepali politics was foreign interventionism. That foreign interventionism came in two ways. One is India or Indian hands or Indian entities, one never knows which entity is actually speaking in the name of India, got overly involved in the constitution writing process, uh, forcing it into the slipstream using various powers that India does have with a neighbor, that too with an open border. As a result, I could say this, with Indian influencing, there was an attempt to divide Nepal's federal provinces into, in the hills you may do whatever you want, but in the plains it has got to be one province, 20 miles by 500 miles long, like a long, you know, line of the Peru's coastline. It was not going to work, but it was supposedly meant to be a buffer. And there has never been actually in my recall, recollection the kind of security threat to India that he needed that. Then in the second constituent assembly the idea came that we will need two provinces. So the provincial issue and the interest, apparent interest of Indian authorities of some entity or the other wanting to have a kind of provincial demarcation supposedly in India's interest that roiled the waters where the Madhesi people or at least the Madhesi Badi politicians of the plains of Nepal also got mixed up in all of that, which also resulted uh, in the blockade of a uh, five month long blockade of 2016. Now we come back to the end of the second constituent assembly, the constitution was written. This constitution was written not by scholars or jurists or lawyers, it is essentially prepared by politicians. When I mentioned earlier uh, foreign interventionism, I did mention India. Let me also mention what in Nepal are uh, all powerful force is the donor community, the western donors who realized that Nepal was a country where you could actually uh, get involved in politics. Other, other places you build bridges and you provide uh, oral rehydration salts. But Nepal was so open to the world um, and the Nepali Kathmandu middle class was so romanticized by the West for not having been a colonized society that they, the West could do no wrong. So they infiltrated the Nepali constitution writing process as well and also helped delay it by providing funds for activism which should have been left to the Nepalis alone because the moment you have donor funded activism it becomes shrill and uncompromising. And that also delayed things a bit. But in the end, you could say in a way, Nepal landed feet first. You could also say that this was due to the sheer sagacity of the people of Nepal and not the politicians themselves. Although I do give Nepali politicians more credit than my colleagues tend to in Kathmandu. If there is a question on that, I will answer it later. So, how do we land feet first? Um, 
the enormous amount of pressures on Nepali society, what you would call fissiparious tendencies, class based, altitude based, region based, east west based, all kinds of problems. All of these were looking like they were intractable. What would happen to this country which has so much going for it in terms of natural resources? I would suggest that um, this is my personal view that the Nepali people have an innate sense. Give me another five minutes, Sundar. Okay. Um, Nepali people have an innate sense without any economist telling them so that the economy, sorry, the the geography has an has the kind of natural resources that would provide growth in Nepali uh, to the Nepali people that they would provide livelihoods at a high level relative to the rest of South Asia in particular uh, the contiguous parts of South Asia to Nepal which is the Uttar Pradesh, the Ganga states and then the Ganga Maidan as well as Sikkim and uh, Uttarakhand. So they have been waiting and then I go back to my earlier point they have been waiting knowing that this country has some abilities to pay back if for historical injustice regardless of what your ethnicity or your altitudinal uh, provenance may be. The reason I say altitudinal is because the Madhesi population is of the plains and the Madhesi population actually suffered a double whammy. The ethnic people of the hills suffered from economic marginalization but they did not suffer from lack of ownership of the state. The Madhesis by the Kathmandu state was made to feel that they lost economic opportunities because they didn't have it. Neither did they were they regarded as owners of the state, that they were regarded as uh, some kind of a pariah. And that is why when the Madhesi movement exploded, nobody was expecting it. The World Bank had done a little diversion, I'll come back to my final point. The World Bank had conducted a study, expensive study, a thick volume that they put out saying the title inclusion in Nepal and inclusive politics. But as they published it, the Madhizi movement of 2006-7 over the winter exploded in the face of everybody. Why did it explode? Because it was not funded. The moment it, something is funded, you were moved into workshops and seminars. The one reason I believe that the Dalits of Nepal, hill and plain Dalits, who have the more right than anybody else to have a movement that barring anything that should that is violent, which I would not of course support, but if any movement was required, it is a movement for Dalit emancipation. But because the donors already knew about Dalits from India and the rest of South Asia, as they arrived, they were already funding the Dalits and hence and, and the workshops were all, you know, moving on, but there was no activism on the ground. But the Madhesis at that point, as proven by the fact that this World Bank report, all about inclusion and trying to target the Kathmandu state, had forgotten the Madhesi. There was no reference to Madhesi and the Madhesi movement came up because nobody was funding. It was really from the heart, from the people's sense of disfranchisement and marginalization. Now co to come back to my, let's say, the end where I feel that we have landed. Uh, this constitution, uh, for a while we thought, especially in the latest instance because of the Madhes Pahad divide, the hill plain divide and the Kathmandu versus the Madhesi, leadership, Madhesi political leadership divide, we thought what would happen? But in the end, at the penultimate moment, you had uh, the Indian Foreign Secretary coming in a week before uh, or less than a week before the constitution was to be promulgated, asking that you postpone it by a few days. Anything could have happened if that postponement had happened. It could have, again, we'd have gone into another limbo. The Nepali leaders, I believe they were sagacious to do this, rejected that appeal. He came in as one of the political leaders, like a viceroy, uh, wanting, and the body language was all wrong, and the demands were not appropriate to where Nepal was at that time. But the constitution was promulgated. Um, it's a constitution uh, that is a result of enormous levels of, um, what shall we say, it's a constitution that gives everything to everybody. There are some problems with it, particularly in relation to women's citizenship, uh, mother's ability to pass on citizenship, but otherwise, and those things should be sorted out by amendment, 
and many things should be sorted out by amendment because we actually don't know how are we going to implement this this document because it is a thick document full of promises and many many constitutional commissions and uh, all kinds of social justice issues uh, announced as given but the question now is to firstly to adopt the laws for it and secondly to go about and make sure that the bureaucracy owns it the very framers of the constitution that they own it and that we start studying this document to see where are the amendments required and what uh, can be done with the inconsistencies in a document as prepared by politicians that there are contradictions throughout the pages that having been said this constitution uh, does provide for a three tier government if that is made to work and not three tiers of governance but government local government of uh, which runs on a through parliamentary process provincial government that works with parliamentary process and the national government so there are three lists like what you have in india are two lists concurrent list state no three concurrent state and center in nepal in that sense there are four center uh, province as we call it and uh, local entity or local government and concurrent now there is already a problem in the vagueness in the concurrent uh, list vis-a-vis -vis the direct list so the civil society in nepal will have its hand full and uh, if we just sit back then there will be problems in the implementation of this constitution but nepal has come back from the edge many times i personally feel that this constitution has got to be made workable and in making it workable uh, we the political class has learned its lessons of what the public how the public regards it and what may be expected of it more than anything else what i am hoping and it can't be just to it work it can't do just to hope one has to work for it is to really make sure that the local government in particular is able to deliver the kind of services that the nepali people never had for example when the earthquake struck in 2015 april <clears throat> april 26 if nepal had local government we would be way ahead both in search rescue and rehabilitation nepal is foundering till today nearly 3 years later in the post earthquake reconstruction so in every way i think that the the state has been restructured uh the nepali public as a whole has suffered to quite a lot you could say that in terms of uh the polity having uh experienced so much i would used to tell my bangladeshi friends in particular um back in the early 1990s that in nepal we have got democracy on a platter and we have not protected it enough whereas you guys have gone through such horrendous times from the partition to 1971 liberation war what i could say is we've never come to that height of tragedy in numerical terms perhaps but nepal has gone through a telescope period where we had everything from uh, starting in 1996 a uh, armed conflict insurgency um, communal divides foreign interventionism and we still have come up i would say right side up i wouldn't say just for air we have come up right side up now the idea is can you take the country back to the aspirations that were <coughs> clearly expressed in 1959 and again in 1990 i believe that it will happen if civil society is able to fulfill its preconditions because nepal civil society some of it was corrupted by donor funding uh some of it was corrupted by fear of populism some of it was corrupted by party affiliations as a result civil society was not playing its role and hence the politicians were not able to deliver the way they should now we need civil society but not only in kathmandu we need civil society active and i would say for me civil society means everything from an archive to human rights activists so we are trying to promote archives like rmrl 
like uh, Madan Puraskar Pustakalaya in seven provinces of Nepal. So all of these things have to happen. For that, the Nepali public have shown their sagacity. My belief is that A, you need Nepal to be left alone to make its mistakes. That Nepal has made a lot of mistakes as a society. It has learned from it perhaps, but it can still do, do with some more learning. For that, if there is meddling, then certainly it won't work. On the other hand, uh, my sense out of the last uh, month, all of a uh, well, last three months has been that you needed three elections to get to this point. Elections at the local level, enormous problem that you had to do it in three stages, local level elections, including through interventions and all kinds of dissonances. Manage that, then you had to have provincial elections and national elections. Now, in that sense, the constitution is ready for full implementation. The prerequisites were three elections. So now the entire country it has got elected representatives in the local government, in local government meaning village and uh, town. Then you've got uh, uh, provinces and then you've got the national level. Everything is in place. And uh, in, a, in a surprise move, Nepal suddenly had the two left parties, one the Maoists and the UML collaborating uh, for government, uh, to run the government and they did very well in elections. So now, for the first time in 20 years, uh, Nepal may have a government that has a minimum two years to function and possibly five full years. Things have become so bad in Nepal that nobody believes that you can actually have a government for that long. People have been socialized into thinking every government is there for seven, eight months, then either they have fighting, infighting or India will intervene, something will happen and it's gone. So there was no sense of continuity in government. It seems that this is the critical factor that there seems that to be possibilities of, good possibilities of continuity in government for a full five years. But if we just leave it to government, we are bound to make mistakes because there are enough uh, problems in Nepali society. That is why I say that while we have turned the corner uh, definitely in terms of institutions, state structuring and elections, uh, it won't, we won't have turned the corner automatically. And uh, I'll use the very boring term, but one that counts, I believe. You need civil society to ensure stability and ensure democratic governance. And now that we have gone into three-tier governance, we need civil society everywhere. So if you were to ask me, so if you are to really turn the corner, what do you need? I can only give you the very boring answer. Civil society has to act up. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you and uh, uh, Kanak Dixit and uh, for this wonderful uh, evening, uh, giving us insights of Nepal. And also, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ace Pani Selvan for introducing him and also moderating this uh, session. session. Thank you very much, Pani. You know, Kanak uh, was so kind enough to talk about our Amar and connecting the world. I must also uh, thank him for another thing, which is, uh, but for people like Kanak. I think some of us would have quit <laughs> the job of archiving. So I, I sincerely want to thank you, Kanak, for that. And also your father, um, legendary Kamal Mani Dixit. I have not seen Roja Mutya. Roja Mutya died in 92. The library was started in 94. So I only know Kamal Mani Dixit as Roja Mutya. So I had fond memories of this great man. Uh, thank you for coming here and giving this wonderful lecture, Kanak. Thank you all.